Many of the hurdles I had to overcome to become Orthodox were similar to the hurdles I'd have to overcome if I were to become Catholic, such as rejecting the tenets of Protestantism and coming to accept the views held in common by the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox churches, such as rejecting tenets of Protestantism and coming to accept the views held in common by Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, like sacraments, the priesthood, saints, and ecclesiology. So why didn't I become Catholic? What was it about Rome that caused me to choose Orthodoxy instead? Let's start where the Orthodox and Catholics split, a historic event known as the Great Schism. The event is dated to have occurred in 1054, however, this is a tentative date because tensions were rising in centuries prior, and the full effects were not known until centuries later. So what caused the split? As I mentioned in the beginning, the Church was one for roughly the first millennium of Christian history, up until the Great Schism. Also, as previously discussed, teachings of ecumenical councils were binding upon the whole church once they were ratified. Also, as previously discussed, teachings of ecumenical councils were binding upon the whole church once they were ratified. The first ecumenical council drafted a statement of faith known as the Nicene Creed, named after the city of Nicaea where the council was held. In this creed were specific affirmations of Trinitarian theology, especially on Christology, clarifying what the Church believed. The Second Ecumenical Council, held in Constantinople, revised and finalized this creed, now known as the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. It's usually referred to as the Creed, for short. The purpose of this creed was to clarify and codify what the Church believed in contrast to what was being proposed by the various heretical groups at the time. The canons of the Fourth Ecumenical Council ratified the creed and forbade additions or revisions. So guess what happens? Rome makes an addition to the creed. They added the filioque clause, filioque being Latin for and the son, and began reciting it that way in their churches. In the paragraph on the Holy Spirit, the creed states, And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. The Roman creed added the words, and the Son, after proceeds from the Father. So their version of the creed reads, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. This was obviously an innovation, one that finds its roots in the speculative theology of St. Augustine. Not only was it a prideful, non-canonical move on the part of Rome, it also sowed the seed for what would come later with regard to the papacy. The issue of the filioque is one that is very complicated and I will likely not be able to do it justice, but the main issue is this. It fundamentally changes the dynamic of the Trinity and the relationship of each of the members of the Trinity to one another. It puts Jesus on the same level as God the Father and subordinates the Spirit. In other words, the filioque grants the Father and the Son causal power, whereas the Spirit does not have causal power. This means the Father and the Son share something that the Spirit does not, creating an imbalance in the Trinity. The Orthodox view is that the Father is the monarch and thus the origin, so to speak, of all things. Beyond the theological problems with the filioque, there is also the principle of the matter, Rome going against something that was already settled and ratified at a prior council was a major issue. Recall that the understanding of the ecumenical councils was that they were binding because they were ratified by the whole church, the bishops, the laity, and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, to the East, it seemed as if Rome was implying that it knew better than the Holy Spirit. This matter was indicative of a rising issue with the papacy. Rome even gaslit the Eastern churches, saying that the East removed the filioque from their version of the creed and that it was always there to begin with. Obviously, there was no internet or fact-checking at the time, but Rome eventually admitted this was a lie. But the filioque was only one issue, which eventually spiraled into much bigger problems. The other major theological reason for the Great Schism was the debated role of the Pope of Rome. For the first millennium of Christian history, the Pope was considered first among equals, the highest ranking bishop. He could have the first word and adjourn a council, but he never had authority over other jurisdictions. In other words, the Pope of Rome couldn't tell the Patriarch of Constantinople what to do in his jurisdiction. 
and vice versa. As time went on, the Roman Empire grew, along with the Pope's ego. The Pope of Rome eventually began to believe that he did have authority over the other churches. He excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, to which the Patriarch of Constantinople returned the favor. And thus, the Great Schism was official. But again, this was only the beginning of the theological developments that occurred in the West. Let's look deeper at the theological developments which occurred in Rome, particularly with regard to the papacy. After the schism, both East and West still considered themselves to be the true church. As a result, and because Rome was now a single monolithic jurisdiction under the authority of the Pope, major innovations came in church governance. Before the schism, an ecumenical council had to be called by an emperor. With the conflation of both religious and political power being assumed by the Pope, the Pope gave himself the authority to call ecumenical councils. Of course, the Eastern churches did not adhere to the declarations of these so-called ecumenical councils because they were no longer in communion with one another. Nonetheless, Rome today acknowledges 21 ecumenical councils, most of them being convened by themselves. In the centuries following the schism, several attempts to heal the divide were made, albeit unsuccessful ones. At one such council, the Council of Florence in the mid-1400s, St. Mark of Ephesus, who is known to us as a pillar of orthodoxy, courageously stood his ground. He is quoted as saying such things like, It is impossible to recall peace without dissolving the cause of the schism, the primacy of the Pope exalting himself equal to God. And, the Latins are not only schismatics, but heretics. We did not separate from them for any other reason other than the fact that they are heretics. This is precisely why we must not unite with them unless they dismiss the addition from the creed filioque and confess the creed as we do. While Rome was clearly unwilling to compromise on their newly developed understanding of the papacy, some formerly orthodox communities reunited with Rome nonetheless. The Orthodox call these churches uniates, while the Roman Catholic Church refers to them as Byzantine or Eastern Rite Catholic churches. To this day, these communities still exist and compose about 5% of the Roman Catholic Church. They celebrate divine liturgy, their priests can be married, as in Eastern churches, and they even recite the creed without the filioque. Everything would appear to be Orthodox about them except for the fact that they commemorate the Pope. Rome allows them all sorts of exceptions because, seemingly, the rest of their theology is negotiable. So long as one submits to the Pope, that's all that matters. These churches even venerate the aforementioned St. Mark of Ephesus, the very one who called Catholics, which is what uniates would be considered, heretics. How is this not a glaring contradiction for Roman Catholics? Because the Pope considered himself to have universal jurisdiction over all Christendom, this also spilled over into the political world. World leaders were required to submit to the authority of the Pope or else pay salvific consequences. Over the centuries, the Pope amassed more and more power. From the early Church's understanding of papal primacy, this developed into papal supremacy after the schism. By the time of the Vatican I Council in the late 1800s, papal supremacy had evolved into papal infallibility. I'm not kidding, they literally call it that. Which grants the Pope the ability to speak infallible dogmas when speaking ex cathedra, a Latin term for from the chair. The councils used forgeries, such as the Liber Pontificalis, the pseudo Symmachian forgeries, the donation of Constantine, and the pseudo-Isidorian decretals to justify this innovation. But if the Pope had always had this absolute authority, why was the consensus of bishops required at ecumenical councils in the first millennium? Catholics nowadays are forced to pope explain and debate online whether something Papa Frank said was actually dogmatic because perhaps he was speaking ex cathedra. This gridlocks Roman Catholicism into a very serious theological dictatorship, Effectively, what the Pope says goes. It sadly affects a Stockholm Syndrome on the faithful. Don't believe me? Catherine of Sienne, a Roman Catholic saint, once said, 
Even if the Pope is an incarnate devil, we ought not raise up our heads against him, but calmly lie down to rest on his bosom. We dishonor Christ if we dishonor the Pope. Compare this to the Sixth Ecumenical Council's condemnation of Pope Honorius in the 7th century. This is clearly not how the church was always governed, nor how it was meant to play out. It bears repeating Jesus' words from Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Whereas Roman Catholicism views the Pope as the head of the church, Eastern Orthodoxy regards Christ as the head of the church, as it says in Colossians 1, 18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. And again, in Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, he puts all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. But this isn't the only innovation Rome developed. 